Before a judicial committee can be convened, there has to be a confession or two witnesses. So we will never change our scriptural position on that subject. That is ridiculous, isn't it? seems like a long time since I've seen everybody. It's been a while. Um, I was enjoying my summer. My little guy is now back to school as of today. So I finally feel like I can do a video. Um, I had a good summer. I hope, I hope all of you did as well. Um, I had one uh, major bummer that happened. Um, a few, it was actually just a few weeks ago. Um, we had some friends over and um, I just started feeling like really sick and a lot of pain happening. And it just got worse and worse and worse. And next thing I know, my appendix uh, partially ruptured. So I had to get rushed to the hospital and I had an emergency surgery. Appendectomy, I guess you call it. <laughs> but um, that was a bummer for sure. But anyways, <laughs> other than that, it's been really nice. We see um, there's been a few protests that have taken place outside JW Org conventions. And um, they've been very successful. There's been a lot of, um, there's been some media attention drawn to this. And um, one issue that keeps be coming to the fore is um, the child sexual abuse. Um, this is the one thing I think that really disgusts people so much. And it is shocking for people like me even who were part of these organizations to see and to know that this has gone on. Here's a, a clip, just check this one out here too, of uh, something that uh, a Mormon is doing too for uh, things that are going on within his faith. So, we have now entered day 21 of the hunger strike. We've also entered day 21 of the apostles continuing to allow our children to be exposed to dangerous one-on-one -on -one interviews where sexual questions are the norm. That's disappointing that they continue to do that. When you speak about child sexual abuse, most people would tell you that they wouldn't even hesitate to contact the authorities. Yet so much of it goes unreported. Why is this the case? Well, much of it boils down to our culture. For example, most organizations would tell you that reporting child sexual abuse should be the responsibility of the parents. But what if the parent is the abuser? Or what if the abuser is a friend, a close friend or a close relative of the parent? Places of worship within religious organizations, though operating under a pretense of moral cleanness and safety, have proven to be some of the absolute worst places where children have been sexually abused. Looking into why this has been the case can help us to take the necessary steps to change our culture. And here are some of the issues that plague religious organizations and why so much abuse goes unreported. So firstly, one of the reasons is that molestation and rape are treated as a sin and not as a crime. So instead of contacting the police, they prefer to call their lawyers and handle it internally. And in this way, the molester doesn't spend any time in prison whatsoever. He's free to continue molesting. He has no criminal record. He's free to work with children. Another reason, they have clergy privilege. Leaders of these religions, of these religious organizations, hide behind their legal rights. And they refuse to speak out against anything that's going on within their organization, even though they're sacrificing the safety of children. Church policies. These policies have handcuffed victims and protected the molesters. Organizations like the Jehovah's Witnesses have what's called the two witness rule, whereby if there isn't a witness to the molestation and the molester just denies it, then nothing further is done about it. It's crazy, isn't it? How on earth are they going to find somebody to witness 
a molestation. It's such a rare thing to have happen. If you were to go to the authorities with this though and tell them, if, it, if there's no way they'd say to you, was there a witness to this? No. Did you do it? No. Okay. Then nothing is done about it. I mean, you, you would think this is insane because the proper authorities know how to deal with these matters. These religious organizations simply do not. And even when they've been, where they've been mandated by law to report it, they still haven't reported it, as we saw from the Australian Royal Commission recently. Victims are silenced and punished for speaking out. And this all results in a re-victimization of the victims. They won't take a brother to court or a fellow believer. So they have it handled internally. Why involve Satan's system, they'll say. Why sully the name of God, they'll say. These are examples of where they are protecting the organization ahead of the needs of the child. It's, it's pretty sickening to think that this is what's happening, but they don't seem to care about them. They're so concerned about their organization that they're willing to allow these children to be molested for the sake of their good name. <laughs> Undue influence. There's an imbalance of power and the leaders of these organizations are not to be questioned by the rank and file. If you dare think or have any questions for these ones, you're going to realize that you've got a lot to lose and they will hold your family against you, hold you as hostage within their rules because you've got a lot to lose when you speak out. People trust these religious leaders. They're seen as loving shepherds who are there to protect us. Who knew that uh, they, were actually, they were actually ravenous wolves? only pretending and masking as as sheep. Who would have believed me, a priest in 1948 or 47 would abuse you, would do that? Never heard of such a thing because they covered it up. They gained their, the trust of their victims and they groomed them for the, for the abuse. There was a very high profile case in California involving a molester named Jonathan Kendrick. And this is one of the things that he did. He bought a black bra for a young girl. And nobody thought this was weird, you know? And this is the kind of thing that he did to groom his victim for abuse. You know, and this is the other thing about undue influence. Things like this happen and you, something tells you it's not right. But because of the undue influence, you're too afraid to speak out. You look at yourself and you think, maybe it's me that's wrong. Maybe I'm not being nice enough. Maybe I'm being too judgy. You know, and you start, in, instead of doing the right thing, you end up silencing yourself. But this is exactly what they want. And one of the other reasons why this happens within religious organizations is that the leaders of these organizations have no training whatsoever to deal with criminal matters. And make no mistake, molestation is a criminal matter. So they call their lawyers and that's all they're told to do. They don't open up a proper investigation. They don't look at the forensic evidence. They don't look at the circumstantial evidence. They're so hung up on having a, a, an eyewitness to the molestation, which is such a rare, as I said before, it's such a rare thing to happen. Yet eyewitnesses are actually some of the worst testimony to have because an eyewitness sometimes doesn't recall things the way it actually happened. They have fuzzy memories or they could be biased. These are the kind of things that you don't find with forensic evidence. And this is what a police officer would do. They'd look at all the evidence, not just the eyewitness testimony, but everything else that's out there. And they also know how to get people to confess. The elders within an organization, they'll ask the molester, did you do it? And if he says no, okay, <laughs> you're free to go. You know, crazy. Criminals know how, well, they know how to get off and the police are seasoned at dealing with these types of people. They know that, that a molester is probably going to lie. 
So they know ways around it. They know how to get the person to confess, which is something the elders simply don't have that kind of training. I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying they are not, they are ill-equipped to deal with criminal matters. So let's handle, hand it over to the police who know what they're doing. They leave it in God's hands. This is something else that religious organizations do. They think, well, God will protect us. We don't need to do anything. God will deal with it in his own due time. God will bring it out, right? The problem is these things are happening then right under their noses. How can you turn a blind eye to a child being abused? Simply by saying, oh, well, God will deal with it. <laughs> So those are some of the ways that religious organizations have managed to hide child abuse and to keep their molesters protected while re-victimizing the victims. Now, now that you're thoroughly disgusted, <laughs> you're probably wondering, well, what can I do as an individual? Is there anything that we can do to change? Well, the good news is yes, there is. I've been working with an organization called SCARS, which stands for Stop Child Abuse, Aware Advocates for Reform and Safety. And their website can be found at scars.org, S-C-A-A-R-S dot org. And more and more is being added to their website all the time. And what I want to do in my next video, which I plan to film tomorrow, is talk about specific things that we as individuals can do to help enact change and help bring about justice and safety for our children. So stay tuned. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.